So I was asked to speak about the significance of Ashura and Alhamdulillah it's a blessed day and there's a number of things that I would like to cover about this day both from the time of the Prophet وسلم, and before his time as well as some of the historical events that happened on this day of Ashura after his time which was the martyrdom of Hussein radiallahu anhu. So I want to start with the original understanding of where why is it that this day is important for us as Muslims? Where do we get that? Why does this day have significance over other days? Well, we know in general that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made certain days, certain months, certain weeks more sacred than other times. So we already know that their Ramadan is better than any of the other months. We also know that there's four sacred months. And even the Arabs of Jahiliyyah, they used to recognize those four sacred months which were Dhul Hijjah, Dhul Qi'dah, and Muharram, those three together. So this is the third of those three. And then Rajab. And they would prohibit fighting, wars. So even in their Jahiliyyah, even in their Shirk, their polytheism, associating partners with Allah, with their worshipping idols, they had this recognition that there were certain times that were sacred. They also fasted on this day. So the Arabs of Jahiliyyah would actually fast on this day. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, before he was sent as a prophet, he would also fast on this day because he recognized, of course, he, didn't, he did not take part in the practices of the Arabs of Jahiliyyah that were repulsive. He, he, Allah pre preserved him from all of those things. He preserved everything that you can read about the Arabs of Jahiliyyah and what they did. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, even before he was sent as a prophet, stayed away from those things to the point that one time he was out in the, as, a, as a young boy early teenager, he was out in the hills behind Mecca. You know, Mecca is surrounded by all these mountains. And he was up in the mountains, him and two other young boys from Quraysh, and they were tending to the animals. And the, the, being tending to the animals was like you would go out with the animals and camp out there. You would spend a lot of time. So they, they decided, let's go to one of these weddings. And so the Prophet Muhammad as a young teenager, young boy, and these two other people, they decided to go and they made a deal of who would watch the sheep or the goats, the animals, while the others went to the, uh, to the wedding. And the Prophet wasallam, of course, as a young boy, he went to attend this wedding and then along the way became sleepy and fell asleep. And he said he didn't wake up until the, the heat of the sun of the next morning was warming his face. So he, Allah sent asleep and made him sleep throughout the whole night so that he would not attend that wedding in the, in the Jahiliyyah uh, uh, of Arabs. So even before he was sent as a prophet, Allah had protected him from practicing any of the, the, the um, any practices that would go against what Allah was preparing him for, for this, for this prophethood. With that said, the practice of fasting on this day of Ashura, he would do. So he recognized there's something special about this day. Even before he was a prophet, he knew that, this, that there was something special about this day. Later on, when he, when he came to Medina, he found the Jewish people of Medina fasting on this day. And he asked them, according to a Sahih Hadith, he asked them, why are you fasting on this day? And they said that this is a day that Allah saved Musa السلام, from Fir'aun. So we know the story of Exodus where Musa السلام, and his people were oppressed under the, the, the Fir'aun. They were enslaved by his people. Then Allah sent messages and sent Musa to, uh, to call Fir'aun, sent him with miracles, and then eventually told Musa السلام, to, to leave during the night. And we know the story of the parting of the sea and the drowning of the Fir'aun and his army. That happened on this day. And so the Jewish people of Medina, in, to celebrate that and to commemorate that, they would fast. And this is, the, this is the, 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 the path of the people of Allah, that our celebrations, we can have cultural celebrations, family celebrations, where we make up new ways to celebrate that, that are customary or cultural. That's fine. There's nothing, as long as it, there's nothing wrong with that, of course, as long as it doesn't go against the Sharia. Ah. But the primary way that we as Muslims celebrate things is through worship, is through ibadah. And so by those who observe the fast of this day or intend to fast it next year or are doing something to make this day different through, through any form of ibadah, maybe it's extra dhikr, extra Quran, extra reflection, whatever it might be, making this day special through ibadah, that is our way 
as believers. According to Imam al-Ghazali in his book, Mukashaf al-Qulub, Umar ibn, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab was asked about this day and why was it special, right? Why was it something that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he, he recognized it as special before he was a prophet, even after he was a prophet, he, he used to fast during this month of Muharram. This was, this was what he did and what his Sahaba did before Ramadan. So that's also something for us to think about, that the Muslims before Ramadan became the traditional month that, that everybody knew about fasting. Muharram was, 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 was treated specially by fasting during this month, especially the day of Ashura. Oh, and of course, one thing to mention about the Prophet ﷺ's response to the Jewish people when they said this was a day that Musa ﷺ was saved. He said, Ana ahaqqu bi Musa minkum. I have more of a right to Musa than you. And this means, this is a reminder to us that even if there's a group of people that claim that they follow Musa ﷺ, there's a group of people that claim that they follow Isa ﷺ, we follow the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and by default all of the other prophets. And so Musa is our prophet before he's the prophet of the Jewish people. In other words, we, we are following Musa السلام, the way Musa would want to be followed. We are following Isa السلام, the way he would want to be followed. If he were to walk into this room right now, and well, Isa السلام, might walk in in the end of time, it's, a po it's possible. If he were to see, if they were to see the three groups, if Musa السلام, were to see the Jewish people, and Isa were to see the Christian people, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his ummah is following him. They, both of those prophets, we can say for, with 100% surety, they would say the ummah of Muhammad, you, you're the ones following me. You, you're the ones following me, Isa. You're the ones following me, Musa alayhi salam. We are preserving their their their, their traditions. We're preserving their their names. We're pre preserving their stories. We're also we're preserving their their, their dignity and their honor. No Muslim would accept for any prophet to be spoken of in a, in a derogatory way. Unfortunately, the comedians, the story writers, the book writers, the movie writers, they'll poke fun, they'll make fun of Musa alayhi salam. They'll make fun of Isa alayhi salam. People are very careful with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But the Muslims, not only, of course, the Prophet is, is at the highest rank, and our respect of him is at the highest rank, but we don't want people to even joke about Isa alayhi salam or about Musa alayhi salam. So that's part of us fulfilling the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he said, Ana ahaqqu bi Musa minkum, that I have more of a right to be following Musa. Now, one interesting thing to note is that even though this was a practice to fast the day of Ashura, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, once he learned that the Jewish people had this practice to commemorate the exodus and the saving of Musa alayhi salam, he did something different with Ashura. What is that? What is that? What was it that he did to, to make the fast of Ashura different? To fast the day before and afterwards. And he did that specifically to make sure that his community and their practice was distinguished from the practice of the Jewish people. In other words, not saying, not coming and saying, okay, Muslims, we had this practice of saying, of fasting Ashura, the Jewish people are doing it, so we can't do it anymore. No, we can do it, and we can even do it better, because we have more of a right to follow and celebrate Musa alayhi salam. But we're going to put a twist on it. We're going to make something different. We're going to fast the day before and the day uh, afterwards, so that when people see the Muslims fasting and the Jewish people fasting, they don't think that they're doing the exact same thing. And this is a, there's a deep lesson in this for us that the, that the Muslims should always make sure that their actions and their traditions and the things they do have the mark of a Muslim. It has the mark of a Muslim, the signature of a Muslim, whatever it is. Writing books, creating organizations, making a business, doing a school, whatever it might be, we have something, we should put something to say we're different. As an example, the Arabs, the Arabs of Jahiliyyah used to keep long hair. They all did. So when we read about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam keeping long hair, it wasn't just that he did it, all of the Arabs did it. To the point that in one of the, the pre-Islamic age of Jahiliyyah, there was a war between two tribes. And they said, we need something 
to distinguish each side from the other so we avoid friendly fire. Because if we both look the same as Arabs in our clothing, in our dress, in our hairstyle, we're, somebody might mistake one of his comrades for the enemy. So they decided that one tribe would shave their heads. And that was to, that, that was to distinguish them. So that tribe said, okay, we're going to shave our heads. In other words, they all had long hair. One of the people, he loved his long hair so much, he said, you know, even though I'm from the shaved head tribe, I want to keep my head long. I'm just going to be careful. And it ended up, he, he ended up getting killed by friendly fire because his own people thought that he was from the enemy. I mentioned that story just to help us picture Arab society. Arab society is not Saudi Arabia of today. It's not Egypt of today. It's not Morocco. It's not Sudan. It's not uh, Oman. It's not any of the current Arab, Arab nations. So it's really important for us to, to, to understand the context of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam to go back and say, okay, what was the original Arab society like? Like as an example, what was the average, what did the average man in Arabia wear? Um, what did he wear? What was the garments? Izar, a lungi. So you see the Yemenis, they've kept that tradition. And in the subcontinent, they have that tradition. Do, do any Arabs of today, aside from the Yemenis, and maybe the Omanis and, and the Emiratis to a certain extent, that, that lower Arabian Gulf, do any of the Arabs wear Izars? as part of their tradition. No. What did the Arabs wear the men around their shoulders? Arida, you know the the like the 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 shoulder cloth that the people put over their clothes, they would actually that would be their clo that would be their clothing. Like they would take it and like wrap it around their um, so maybe close to the way Scottish people, you know, like if they have like kilts and like a a, a woolen wrap, that's very close to the way the Arab men and sandals. Um, so, so the Prophet وسلم, when he kept his hair long, he did something different with it. What did he do? He parted it down the middle. And he parted it down the middle because the, the, the Qurayshi Arabs, the Mushrikeen, they, they would not part it down the middle. And so he's going to keep his long hair, which is also the tradition of the Arabs and many of the Mushrikeen, but he's showing, he says, I want to do something different. The Arabs wore turbans. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore a turban. How did he make his turban different? Anybody? He put a kufi under it. That's one way. Another way. He wore a tail to the turban. So when you, when you tie the turban, you see a lot of people with, with tails. That is, that's, 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 a, that's a, um, a fashion that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam established to, to make his turban different than the mushrikeen. Do you see what ha what's happening here? He's saying, I'm not going to completely go against, to, to show that I'm different, I'm not going to go completely against my people and their culture and their traditions. They have long hair, I have long hair, but I'll part it. They have turbans, I have turbans, but I'll wear a cap underneath, or I'll have a tail, or I'll do both. So that when somebody sees him, you know, at first glance, you might not, you, you, will, you wouldn't be able to see the difference, but I'll, I'll give you an example and a funny story. So when you see a Muslim turban, as opposed, opposed to a Sikh turban, you can all tell the difference right away, right? Can people who are not Muslim or not Sikh, can they tell the difference? No. So what happened after 9-11, there were people who, Sikh people, like in Texas and other places, who actually were, were shot and sometimes killed because people thought that they were Muslim because they had a turban. So they can't, from the outside, they just see a turban. They can't see. It's a very subtle difference. We understand it because it's part of our culture. We, we know that's... So uh, the, the funny story is I was going into a 7-Eleven. There was a lady. She was coming out or going into the store. And I saw her car was full of, like, pillows and luggage. So I could tell she's a traveler. And in any case, whether or not she was a traveler, um, I'm going to be nice. And I held open the door. And so she was like, oh, thank you. Because, you know... Some common courtesies now people don't do anymore, so sometimes people are a little bit shocked. So she could see me. I had my, my kids. They were getting into the van, and she said, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're Muslim. I could tell you're Muslim. Now listen how she can tell I'm Muslim. These are the signs that she knows that I'm Muslim. She said, um, you're Muslim because not only do you have a beard, but you also have a mustache. And you do that so that you can be different than the Sikh people who don't keep mustaches. I said, okay, all, all of a sudden, this is, I guess, Islam explaining. This was like, she's telling me about, 
It's like, no, that's not actually the case. But she was sure about it. And then she looked at my daughter, and my daughter was in the back of the van. She said, oh, yeah, and that's your wife in the back of the van. <laughs> in other words, yeah, you're Muslim. You put your wife in the back seat. And I was like, no, A, that's my daughter, and B, that's not, that's not our tradition. Uh, there was another time I was at a Whole Foods, and I was checking like an ingredient on the bottom of, of something, and a lady saw me, and she's like, oh, what are you looking for? I was like, I explained to her the ingredient, and she said, that's not a problem. I said, oh, thank you, uh, but... Uh, in other words, in a nice way, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I said thanks or no, you know, but, but, uh, but no thanks. Then I walked, you know, I was in the other part of the store, and then here she comes again, heat-seeking missile. She wants to tell me about Islam. And she said, you know, I lived in a Muslim country for so many years, and nobody ever said that that ingredient was an issue, and you're wrong about it. And so then at that point, I said, you know, I've studied this religion for about 10 years. At that point, it was about 10 years, seriously, like regular uh, studies. And I know that this is, you know, here's the issue. And I started breaking down. I gave her a fiqh lesson in the hall, in the aisleway of uh, Whole Foods. But then I got away as quick as I could because then she was like, oh, yeah, but, you know, even it was something about an ingredient with alcohol. And she said, well, you know, even in orange juice, there's some alcohol. And so that's not an issue. And so oh, I said, OK, I can't. Uh, we're not really having a discussion when you're just... Uh, Islam explaining to me. So, okay, so I use those stories to say that there's people on the outside when they see things, they're, they're not going to notice those subtleties. But amongst the Arab people, when they would see a turban, they know what their turbans look like. So would a Sikh person, when they see a Muslim's turban, would they know that's not, that's not a, a turban from our tradition? They know it. So the mushrikeen of the Arabs, when they would see a Muslim with that signature tail style, with the, uh, with the, with the, 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 the kufi underneath or a cap underneath, they would tell, this is different. So there's a powerful lesson there from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that w we need to stand out. It doesn't have to be blatant stand out, but we can put a subtle twist onto things. So uh, Imam al-Ghazali mentions in his book Mukashif al-Qulub that Umar ibn al-Khattab was asked about Ashura and why it's so noble. And so he listed a few things. Now, one thing to note is that some of the significance of Ashura, we get directly from hadith. And some of the hadith are sound, they're sahih hadith. Some of them are weak in narrations, and I'm, I'll mention one of those and what it is. And then some of them are statements of the Sahaba, like Umar, like this statement. And then some of the statements are later people of, who have given explanations of the Quran, tafsir. Now, where are they getting these stories? So if it's not from the hadith, if the Sahaba aren't learning it from the Prophet who's telling them, and they're talking about whatever subject it might be, where would the Sahaba be getting information about previous times and scriptural knowledge? Where would they be getting this? Maybe my question wasn't clear. Um, if we have like on Ashura, we only have a few hadith where the Prophet وسلم, is talking about Ashura. But then we have in the tafsir, we have all of these other narrations and we have Umar making statements and Umar, how would Umar know some of these pre-prophetic things? How would he know that? One of two ways. Either he heard it from the Prophet wasallam, and he's narrating it without saying, the Prophet taught me this, but usually that's not the case. Or the Sahaba would learn from the Jewish scholars at the time and the Christian scholars at the time, like Ka'ab al al-Ahbar who was a Jewish scholar who became Muslim. Now, when he became Muslim, he didn't completely give up all of his scriptural knowledge. He just said, okay, this is Islam. It helps me know what's wrong from my scriptural knowledge. But here's a lot of other things that I have, and here you go. And so the Muslims had this tradition of taking what's called the Israeliyat, the stories of Bani Israel, the Christians and the Jews, and then passing them along. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that we can preserve those stories we just don't necessarily have to believe it or reject it, as long as it's not in clear contradiction of our deen. And I'll give you some examples. So, um, two examples, actually, and this goes into, I'm not going to, this is not a discussion about evolution, but these are interesting things that were mentioned by Ibn Abbas, who must have learned, who could have learned them from Ka'b al-Ahbar and other Jewish scholars. But he says that, that there are seven, we know that there are seven earths, just as there are seven heavens. And so Ibn Abbas said that in each of the seven earths, there is an Adam like your Adam. And there is a Musa like your Musa. And there is a Isa like your Isa. And there is a Muhammad like your Muhammad. Wow. 
It's pretty interesting, right? What is, what's going on there? Now, this is something that it, various scholars had to contend with. What's going on here? My, one of my teachers, Murabat al-Hajj, our main teacher, he actually has a book where he talks about ambiguous hadith and ayahs from the Quran. In other words, ayahs and, uh, ayahs and, and, and a hadith that are not exactly clear. Like, what is the, does that seem like a clear hadith? doesn't like what's going on there so he has his explanation and other scholars have given all others could be a multiverse maybe maybe it's other planets maybe it's other dimensions whatever it might be something's going on here now it's a statement which hadith means statement it's a hadith of ibn abbas but did ibn abbas said qala rasulullah that the messenger of allah said that no he didn't so he's taken from other from other people um I'm not going to go too much into it, but I, I think you get the idea that there's traditions that were collected and that we don't necessarily have to, have, to, have to reject. And I mention this because some people might say, when we're talking about Ashura, let's stick to the Sahih Hadith. Well, okay, what about the Da'if Hadith? What about the weak Hadith? And I'll mention one of those. No, we should, we should mention it. Well, what about the Isra'iliyat? Can we mention those as well? Even if we don't have the Prophet وسلم, telling us this, but if the Sahaba collected this from the Jewish scholars and it was important enough for them to pass it along, well, there's something to be mentioned about that. And so Umar عنه, was asked about this day, what's the significance of Ashura? And he said, on this day, Allah created the skies and the earth and the preserved tablet on the Loh. This was the day that he created that. On this day, he created uh, the angel Jibreel alayhi salam. On this day, he created Adam and Hawa alayhim salam. On this day, he created Jannah. On this day, he enabled Adam to be able to live in Jannah alayhi salam. And on this day, the first rain on earth was on Ashura. So Allah is making certain days that are special. And uh, the, the Allah told Musa alayhi salam, and of course this by extension all of the prophets, to tell his people, وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ Remind them of the days of Allah. Those days that Allah has made special. We don't know why, but it is special. And so we should know about that. We also know that, that on this day, according to another hadith, that Nuh alayhi salam, after being in the flooded earth in, in the ark, when the water started to recede and his, mount, and his ship settled on uh, al Judi, the Mount Judi, it was on this day. This was the day that that happened. In another narration, the punishment that was supposed that was aimed at the people of Yunus alayhi salam we know in that story Yunus alayhi salam was sent as a prophet Jonah to his people Yunus ibn Matta he was sent as a prophet to his people and he called his people and he called his people and then once he realized there's no hope they are refusing my message what did Yunus alayhi salam do he left but he skipped a step the step was, what was the step that he skipped as a prophet? You call your people, you bring them glad tidings of Jannah, you warn them of a punishment not only in the Akhirah, but that if you refuse my message, you will be punished in this world. And, but then the prophet has to wait, and he has to wait for permission from Allah to leave that place before the adab, before the punishment uh, settles down on but Yunus alayhi salam could see everything. He could see their arrogance and their rejecting of the message. He's called them. He's given them the warning. He's telling the adab is here and he left. And he left before Allah told him to leave, before he gave him permission to leave. And so that's the way, that's one of the reasons why when he was on the ship and the, the, the storm started happening, the captain of the ship said, wait a minute, there's no storms of that nature in this season. And so they said, what is it? They said, there is a runaway slave on our ship. There's a runaway slave on our ship. So Yunus alayhi salam realized that. And so the, the tradition at that time is that if, you, if a storm comes out of nowhere and you have a runaway slave, you throw the runaway slave into the, into the ocean. And so then Yunus alayhi salam, he realized that at that point. He said, I'm the runaway slave. I shouldn't have left the city before Allah gave me the permission because that was the order of things. Now, Yunus alayhi salam did not do anything haram. And the prophets don't do anything haram. They, can, they cannot disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when they do something that is lesser in status, so basically, if there's two good things and they do the lesser things, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could give them ta'deeb. He's going to gently 
um, remind them of what they should have done. And so the story of swallowing, uh, being swallowed by the whale happens to Yunus alayhi salam. When Yunus alayhi salam had left the city, soon after he left the city, his people realized, oh, we need, to, we need to accept the message. Now we realize we got it. But by that time, Yunus had left. They actually left the city searching for Yunus alayhi salam to tell him, we now accept. They could see the adab, they could see the punishment on the horizon. Like they could see the winds and the clouds, whatever it was, they could see the punishment on the horizon, but it had stopped. And normally once the, 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 the sunnah of Allah, the, 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 what happens normally, once the adab comes down, there's no turning back, there's no stopping it. When the angels were sent to destroy the people of Lut, for their actions, and that's very important for us to understand, especially in this day and age, when they were sent to destroy the people of Lut السلام, and those angels came and they visited Ibrahim السلام, to give him the good news about having a child, Ibrahim السلام, tried to plead with the angels to not destroy the people. And that's where Allah says in the Quran about Ibrahim that he's halim, he's forbearing, he's very nice, he's gentle. That's why he wanted those people to not to not be punished, but that was it. Once the, once the angels were sent, that's it, there's no turning back. A similar tradition of this is that once a prophet, once a prophet of Allah dons his armor, puts on his armor to go fi sabilillah, he does not take it off until he is engaged in battle. And this is why there was a time, one of the battles that the Sahaba engaged in, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sought their counsel, they decided war, he went inside and put on his armor, he came out and by that time the Sahaba said, well, maybe we should negotiate. And he said, that can't be the way. Because the tradition of all of the prophets is once they put on their armor to go fi sabilillah, they cannot take off their armor until they have engaged the enemy. And so there are certain things, certain sunan practices, traditions, that once they're, once they're set in motion, there's no turning back. And that's what happens when the adab of Allah comes down on a people, it will not be turned back. The only exception is the people of Yunus alayhi salam. Because they, they made a, an effort, they recognized we need to go get him, now we believe we'll go get him, and that adab was on the horizon, stayed, and then left. And that's the only time of all of the people, the perished nations, that adab was sent, the people of Ad and Thamud and all of the others, once the adab goes down, it's, it's no turning back. The removal of that adab from the people of Yunus, happened on Ashura, on this day, according to the people of Tafsir. So we can see, once again, there's, there's, there's things that are happening uh, on this day. The, the ship of Nuh السلام, settles on the Mount Judi on this day. And there's, uh, there's many other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the forgiveness of Adam alayhi salam on this day. And according to a hadith, and this is an amazing hadith when we hear it, that Adam alayhi salam, when he asked for forgiveness, he said to Allah, I ask you by the rank of Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He said, I ask you by the rank of Muhammad. Now, this is not shirk. Of course, this is a messenger of Allah. They don't do any, any shirk or any actions. Um, this, is, this, is, this is just like if a person comes to do um, uh, intermediate, brings somebody in, like in the Arabs, they call it wasta, right? You need to have some bureaucracy push through the system, bring somebody who's known. You, you're just bringing somebody who's known. So he said, I ask you by the rank of Muhammad, and Allah revealed to Adam alayhi salam, and he said, how do you know the name of Muhammad and I have not created him yet? He said, I looked onto the leaves in Jannah and I saw written on every single leaf in Jannah, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. And I knew that you would only put the most beloved name to you after your name. And so for that reason, I ask you by the rank of Muhammad to forgive me for my mistake. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, 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 forgave him. And according to some narrations, that forgiveness happened on this day. Ibrahim alayhi salam in the story where he was sent into the fire, that that fire was ex ex extinguished on this day. 
Ayyub alayhi salam tri uh, tribulated with all of the sicknesses, his relief from all of those illnesses happened on this day. The vast kingdom of Sulaiman alayhi salam, I mean, imagine his kingdom. Not only does he have humans, he also has shayateen as his servants that can help build his castles and go into the oceans and go into the mountains. He can speak to the birds. They're in the army. That happened on this day. Yunus alayhi salam was taken out of um, the belly of the whale and forgiven on this day. And Isa alayhi salam was raised to the heavens on this day. As a just to take a little break, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, during his, during his lessons, he would sometimes take a break and he said, bring in the poets. We need to take a break with the poets. So one of my shiuch, he used to always joke. He would always tell us jokes. And so he told us a joke about the hudhud of Sulaiman alayhi salam. So the joke is that, um, and Allahu alam where this came from, where this story came from, but it was mentioned in the books, that the hudhud, the little bird, have you ever seen the, uh, it's, in English it's spelled H-O-O-P-O-E. If you've never seen a hudhud, type it in, you know, Google, look at the, the picture of a hudhud, because that bird is mentioned in the Quran. So the hudhud, that little bird, which is not much bigger than maybe a mockingbird or um, a robin, even smaller than a robin uh, size-wise, he invited the army of, of Sulaiman alayhi salam to dinner. The food. He said, you'll be my guests. And the, imagine this vast army um, doesn't know how this little hood is going to feed them all. So he said, meet me at the side of the ocean. He went there. He took a locust, like a, which is a big grasshopper looking thing, in his beak. And he dropped it into the ocean. And he said, Man laham fal yashrab al -maraq. Whoever doesn't get any of the meat, go ahead and drink some of the soup. Okay, so those are, those are the many things that happen on this day. And so we know the, the, the special significance. There's many things that we can say about the special significance of this day. If nothing else, then we can say that the Prophet wasallam used to fast it. And we have Sahih Hadith that, that, that confirm this. There's other practices that have been accepted by the Muslims about this day. And they're established by some Ahadith which are weak in narration. And this is important for us to know. There's three types of hadith. Sahih hadiths, sound hadiths, lesser, uh, at a lesser level is hasan hadiths, and then da'if hadith, weak hadith. There's a fourth type, which is not a hadith, but it's a fabricated hadith. So sometimes people would make up statements and say the Prophet ﷺ said this. That's a fabrication. But those first three types, he said it, and in the, the, the hadith da'if, he most likely said it. It's just the strength of that hadith. We, we, we're not going to take rulings, ahkam, except from sahih, sound hadiths, or hasan. Again, I don't want to go into a, uh, a deep lesson, but it is important because of something that relates to this day. There is a hadith narrated in the musnad of Imam Ahmad that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said that on this day, you should do tawsi'ah to your family. You should do extra things. Like, you know, normally if your budget, your budget of spending, uh, oh, Baba, Mama, can we buy this? Can we? No, 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 we got to, you know, not. But on this day, you should be open arms. That's wasa, like go ahead and something extra. Doesn't, it doesn't mention specifically what, but it's, it's something that you just do, um, that you do, so, uh, do extra for your family. And so for whatever you do for your family, to do something special for them on this day is uh, considered something that can be done. Now some people might say, well it's a hadith da'if, it's a weak hadith, so we shouldn't be doing, making a practice upon it. Imam al-Nawawi, who's one of the most, the foremost uh, scholars of, of hadith, he says by ijma, by consensus of this ummah, you can take a weak hadith and do an extra action, as long as we know we're not going to um, give extra importance to this, it's just an extra fadila that we're going to do. Um, and so that's that's permissible to do. So if you if you choose to do that, alhamdulillah. If you don't, that's that's also allowed. But if we see people doing the tradition of tawsi'a and uh, on Ashura because of that hadith, then we should not do inkar as if it's a fabrication. Now, 
On the topic of fab fabrication, I want to segue into a historical event, a very tragic and sad historical event that happened on this day. And a discussion about Ashura cannot be complete unless we have that discussion. And it is the martyrdom of Hussein radiallahu anhu. When Hussein and many members of his family and his group were, were killed by, the, by, by Yazid and his, um, and, and, and his army. The reason why I mentioned fabrication to segue is that there are people within the Muslim Ummah who believe that, all, you, see, you see all of this that we said about Ashura, the Hadith, and all of those things, we can see that it, there's something special about this day. Well, there's certain people that said, oh, all of that that you're talking about, the fast of the Prophet, and the, that the Arabs used to fast it in Jahiliyyah, and Nuh alayhi salam ship, and all of that stuff, you guys made it up. That's what they say. You made it up, and you turn this into a day of fasting and celebration. And like if you go to some countries like in Egypt, they have specific dishes, right? In any other countries where they have Ashura dishes, where it's actually called Ashura? They have a specific, a specific dish that they make. They give greetings like it's Eid. But they said, you made all of this up to cover up the tragic event that happened to Hussein. And that could, there's nothing that could be further from the truth than that. Because we know, as the people of Sunnah and the Jama'ah, we know how our tradition is preserved. And there's too much going on for all of those people to have made it up. When we have people like Omar confirming it, and Ibn Abbas confirming it, and then later scholars like uh, uh, Imam al-Shafi'i and others confirming, yes, there's something that happened on Ashura previous to the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we're going to recognize it. Now with that said, Hussein Radiallahu Anhu was martyred on this day. I'm not going to go into it too much but it is important for us to understand what happened on that day and who Hussein was to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's enough to say that was his grandson. That was Hussein that when he would see him he would pick him up and sniff him as if, the, uh, as if he was the sweetest fragrance, and he was to him. He said, this is my Rayhan of the dunya. Like we all have something. Some people like ro the smell of roses. Some people like certain utr, certain perfumes. Everybody's got a, a preferred scent that they love in this world. That just, I love that scent, whatever it might be. For some people, it might be lavender. Some people, maybe it's green tea, whatever it is. Everybody, if I ask everybody, you have two or three or four things that you, it's really therapeutic. When you, when you smell it, and you can't get enough of it. For the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that fragrance was Hassan and Hussein. And we, anybody who's parents, you know when you pick up kids, especially young kids, they have a certain scent. And the shiuch say that's because of their, their, their distance from sins and from dhunub. Um, and so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to, used to pick them up and, and, and love them and kiss them and put them on his shoulders and, and get on the ground and let them ride on his back. And the uh, Umar Radiallahu Anhu one time saw Hassan and Hussein riding on the, the back of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, what a great riding animal they have. So he loves them. He's, he's, uh, you could imagine the, the epitome of a grandfather and grandchildren and that love that they had between them. And he said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about Hassan, that Hassan will make a, he will resolve a conflict between two great parties of the Muslims. He foretold this of what happened. This is important for us to know. He also told us, he could also, you could also see in a lot of hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stressing to the ummah, love my family, take care of my family. In the Quran, it says, the Prophet ﷺ says, I don't ask any ajr from you. Nothing. I don't want any money from you. Meaning, in conveying this message, in carrying that message that would have crushed the mountains. Right? If we sent this mountain down uh, upon a mountain, it would have crushed it. He carried that message and he conveyed it to us. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was patient with his people when they threw garbage on his back. He was patient with the people of Ta'if when they ran him out of his city throwing stones at him. And earlier we mentioned about Yunus ibn Matta on the way back from Ta'if while his feet were, his blessed feet were sticking to the sandals because the blood was drying 
from his feet. And he stopped under the shade of a tree and two Arabs in a garden, they could see him and they had compassion for him in his state. Could you imagine being beaten and stones thrown and chased out of a city by the children and the insane people? To add insult to injury, that's who they made them do. They sent out their children to do that. So they took compassion on him and they sent their slave over to where he was and he, with a plate of grapes. And so the young servant put the grapes down and the Prophet ﷺ picked it up. But before he ate one, what did he say? Bismillah. And the young man looked up and he said, what is that you said? I have never heard that. Imagine he's amongst the mushrikeen of the Arabs. And he said, he said, um, uh, what is your name? Addas, I think it is. He said, Addas. He, where are you from? From um, uh, Nineveh. He said, you're from the city of my brother, Yunus ibn Matta. He said, how do you know Yunus ibn Matta? You see the connection that's happening there? He was a believer, this young servant that had been taken in as a slave by the, by the, by the polytheist Arabs, and he could see them never mentioning the name of Allah over their food like what the Prophet ﷺ did with those grapes. And so at that time, I mean, if you, it's, a, it's an amazing story to read the story of Addas um, and read it when you have time and by yourself and just to reflect on the Prophet ﷺ in that state, coming back from Ta'if. He carried that message and he was there at Badr and he was there at Uhud when they knocked out his, when they knocked out his teeth and when his, when his helmet was hit so hard that it stuck to his skull and one of the Sahaba had to pull it out and use his teeth and, and lost some of his teeth pulling it out. He was there in Mecca when Beni Hashim had the, the, the embargo placed on them for three years. He did all of that to convey the message. And he said, لا أسألكم عليه أجرا. I don't, I don't want anything, no, no payment for me conveying the message except Except what? One thing. He asked for one thing. Love my family. Love my family. That's it. All of what he did for us, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he doesn't want anything from us except that we love his family. Now, when we look at it, some people might say, okay, we understand it, the family. Some other people might say, well, we don't want to create a dynasty in Islam or uh, 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 aristocracy in Islam. What is this, what is this love of Ahlul Bayt that's going on? Well, we know first and foremost, if the Prophet ﷺ is guiding us to this, there's something important about it. If he tells us, raise your children, give them ta'deeb, have them have manners on three things. Love of your Prophet, hubbi nabiyyikum, wa hubbi ali baytihi, and love of his family, wa qira'at al-Qur'an and recitation of the Qur'an. As an interesting, if you want to look at like the philosophy, like philosophy of education, there was a man, a alim, a great alim, Sheikh Salih al-Ja'fari, who was from Sudan, and his grandfather was from Egypt, but he was a few generations into Sudan, and he was born in Sudan in a small city. Sheikh Salih al-Ja'fari was known to be a righteous man from the time he was a young child. Even as a young child, as a young boy, he wanted his mom and dad to have a mushaf right next to him. So if he ever woke up at, in the middle of the night, he wants to grab the mushaf and read from the mushaf. Now we might put a phone next to our kids. Oh, just you, if you wake up, just you know, watch something, listen to something, listen to some nasheed or something. Salih al-Ja'fari, Sheikh Salih al-Ja'fari wanted to have a mushaf next to him. He said, and we can believe him to be truthful in what he said, that every time I close my eyes in sleep, I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I saw the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He studied in Sudan, he memorized the Quran, he began his early studies there, then he went to Azhar. And when he was in Azhar, he studied with a number of scholars. One of the scholars that he created a close connection with was Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Habibullah Wild Mayaba. One of the, uh, the, one of the Mayaba, one of the, the children of Mayaba, it was a family of 12 scholars, men and women, who left Mauritania when the French invaded because they were of the opinion that once the kuffar are in control of a land, you have to make hijrah. And so they left. And so they left and they went 
to Mecca and Medina, and then some of them uh, settled back. Habibullah, Sheikh Habibullah settled in Egypt as a scholar of Hadith. His brother Muhammad al-Khadr settled as the Mufti of the Malikiyah in Medina. And then he left with the Hashimi family into Jordan, and he became the first Hashimi Qadi in the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. A little short history there. My dad's from Jordan. I was born in Jordan, so I have to put that in there. Sheikh Habibullah Wild Mayaba was teaching hadith in, in Azhar. And Sheikh Saleh al Ja'fari was his student. But Sheikh Saleh al Ja'fari was so, so, such a special soul, he didn't like to see other people disobey Allah. He didn't like to see ma'asiyah. And so he came to his Sheikh, Sheikh Habibullah, and he said, I can't finish my studies in Azhar because Cairo is too big of a city. There's too many people that are disobeying. I want to go back to my small village in Sudan so that I can be away from people who are disobeying Allah. So Sheikh Habibullah said, go to the, um, go to the market and, and buy us a roasted was duck. Or would it be goose? Goose, a roasted goose. How big is that animal going to be? So we can eat it together. He brought it. Sheikh Saleh al-Ja'fari brought it back. And he set it down. And so he thought he and the Sheikh are going to both eat from this meal. The Sheikh, Sheikh uh, Muhammad Habibullah, the Mauritanian Sheikh, who's a Hadith scholar in, in Azhar, he said, no, I already ate. Go ahead and eat by yourself. And so now he has to eat this entire goose by himself. And he ate and he ate and he ate until he was like super full. He couldn't eat anymore. Then Sheikh Habibullah said, now it's time for dessert. He said, Sheikh, after I've eaten all of this, I don't have any room for dessert. He said, Saleh, you have filled your heart with obedience of Allah. You don't have room for disobedience. Don't worry, the people of this area in Cairo will not affect you. You will not be affected. Just like you're not going to be tempted by that dessert after you've shabit, you've satiated your hunger from that roasted goose, you have no more room for, for sweets, you're not going to have room for, for disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so with that nasiha from his Sheikh, Sheikh Saleh al-Ja'fari completed his education in Azhar, became one of the foremost hadith scholars, even as a student, if Sheikh Habibullah, imagine you're teaching hadith in Azhar, what does that mean? And when Habibullah would not uh, be able to take the, uh, the, the dars, Sheikh Saleh al-Ja'fari would, would, would substitute for him. And then he went on, you can, see his, you can see his picture, I encourage you to look up his picture, you can see some of his durus that he gave. What's interesting about Sheikh Saleh al-Ja'fari is that he had an immense impact on people. And people later asked him, what, what is it that guides you in your speeches and in your lessons to people? He said, I focused on three things. I want people to love the Prophet. I want people to love his family. And I want people to read the Quran. And if you look at all of his lectures and his books and his works, you can see that's what he's guiding us towards. And so just go home on YouTube tonight and type in Saleh al-Ja'fari and listen to some of those, those nasheeds specifically about love of the family of the Prophet And I guarantee you, if you listen to it with an open heart, you will not finish that without tears running down your, your, your face. And you will increase in your love and your respect for the family of the Prophet So he's taking that Sheikh Saleh is from that hadith. I'm saying this to say that the Prophet ﷺ is preparing his ummah for something by teaching them, love my family. Why? Because if you're connected to the Prophet ﷺ, that's a blessing. And normally what happens when people have blessings, other people become jealous of it. Yusuf ﷺ had a blessing, his family became jealous of it. Adam ﷺ had a blessing, Iblis became jealous of it. And so the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is preparing his ummah for this because what happened throughout history, there were atrocities, there were massacres by the governments against the family of the Prophet it, it happened. It happened so much that at the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he instituted a new tradition in the khutbas that was not stated before. He said, this ayah needs to be mentioned in every single khutbah. Verily, Allah commands to justice, adl, and ihsan, goodness, and give to your family. 
He wanted that from the members of the ummah. If you, how many of you have gone to a khutbah and you hear the last khutbah, end with that. That's from Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and that's to send a message to the ummah. Taking care of relatives is part of our deen. And so if taking care of your own relatives is part of your deen, what do you think about taking care of the relatives of the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam? He wanted that message to go out there to get people to stop in their tracks. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who didn't like this. We have to stop at 8.15, right? So in seven minutes. I'm not going to go into all of the details. I'm also recognizing the, the, the age levels of the crowd. For the older people, it's important to understand what happened. For the younger, I would say for parents and family members, focus, let your children know about the family of the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. Do, do we know the names of his aunts and uncles? Do we know the names of his wives? Do we know the names of his children? Do we know the names of his grandchildren? Do we know the names of, of the, the, ahl, those er, the Ahl al-Bayt, the early Ahl al-Bayt at, at, at that time? That's something that, that we need to do and we can do it as a method of following the Sunnah of the Prophet Additionally, we want to know some of the history. Ali, Ali anhu, was assassinated. There was turmoil afterwards. There was a split between two groups. And Hassan, anhu, he should have been the rightful Khalifa afterwards. But he gave up his haq, his right, to avoid a civil war. And that affirms what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about Hassan, that he will resolve a conflict between two great armies of the Muslims. But the, 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 the understanding was that once that Khalifa passes away, it'll go back to Hassan. Hassan died mysteriously, some said by poisoning. And even his children and his children's children kept getting attempts as, as, of assassination onto them to where his grandson, Hassan's grandson, fled and ended up where? In Morocco, Idris, Mulay Idris. And he established the city of Fas. His, Idris is Kabir. He married a, a, a Berber woman by the name of uh, Kinza. And that started fast. The amazing history of fast was started by a great, 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 great grandson of the Prophet ﷺ fleeing political persecution. His son Idris the, the second built out the rest of, uh, of fast, and there's an amazing story about that. Many generations later, there was actually an attempt. Well, I don't want to go into uh, all of it too much, but there's a history that history continues and fleeing to the point that there was so much. Um, uh, atrocities against the Al al Bayt, especially the Adarisa, that some of them changed their last names. So there's families like the Ghumari family that are actually Adarisa, but they took on the name Ghumari so that they would cloak that they're Adarisa because they were literally being hunted down. And some of them traveled back to the east, and so then now you get Adarisa all the way in, in Yemen and, uh, and, and, and beyond and into Iraq. What happened? Hussein radiallahu anhu, he recognized that he had a right to be the Khalifa. The son of Muawiyah Yazid was, was the, was, was, had the rulership at the time. A group in the people of, of Baghdad asked, said, if you come to us, uh, we'll, 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 um, we'll follow you. I don't want to go into all of the history, we don't have the time. In, in short, Has, uh, uh, Hussein had some people who accepted he said, let's, let, let's go, let's trust the people. Others, even some of the great Sahaba, tried to convince him not to go. And they convinced him even as he, was, he went from Medina to Mecca. And from Medeca, Mecca, some of the great Sahaba with tears in their eyes were saying, don't go, don't go. They're going to, they're, going to, um, um, they're, they're tricking you. Don't believe that. He had hope that they would recognize him to be the, 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 the rightful ruler. But in the place of Karbala, which some of his group said once the, once the atrocity began, they said, how ironic it is that the place that this is happening, this atrocity is happening, is in a place that in Arabic means Karb and Bala. Karb means a um, uh, very sad event, like not even, not even sad event, something worse, like a Karb, like a, like a, a devastating event. What's that? A tragic, yeah. Karb means a tragic, devastating event. Bala means tribulation. And so that's where the meeting of the two armies happened. They had no, the Yazid's army had no rahmah for the people of Hussein, and they, it, it, it ended in a massacre. It ended 
plus with the decapitation of Hussein and his head being taken back to Yazid and the head being taken eventually to where it's now reported to be in Cairo in a masjid where it's in a mausoleum there uh, and it's recognized as the, as the, as the place of where uh, and of the, the, the two grandchildren he was the one who looked most like the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so you can imagine like how evil that person had to have been to, to get to that point. So we don't, um, we don't actually have time to go into it more, but it is a sad event. You could see when the first part, when I'm talking about the significance of Ashura, it's, it's a happy feeling. We get into the tragedy, we see it's going down. That's who we are, the people of Sunnah and the Jama'ah. We can recognize two things at the same time. We can recognize there were many blessed things that happened on this day, and there was a tragic thing that happened on this day as well. We just make sure that our, our even our mourning for, for that tragedy that happened, and we can still mourn for it, we can still be saddened, and we should be saddened when we read about that, but we don't rip our clothes because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when some of you passes away, don't rip your clothes, don't slap your cheeks. And so we know that from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we can that we can mourn, but we do so in accordance with his sunnah. I had wanted to leave time for, for questions. Um, I know this is five minutes, maybe five minutes, qu uh, quick questions. Yes. Yeah. So the question was, we, we mentioned about uh, the, 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 the narration of Umar radiallahu anhu and the significance of this day. And we also know that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the Friday is the best of, of days. And is it safe to assume that this is almost like a double blessing? And yes, we can say that. We can say when there's a convergence, it's just like when 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 Jum'ah uh, when Jum'ah and Arafah happen on the same day, or when Jum'ah and Eid happen on the same day, or when Jum'ah and Ashura happen on the same day. We can say that yes, this is a this is an extra blessing for it to to, to happen. And even if we even if you know aside from just uh, like you said, you take those two narrations, you put them together, and you get like a result. You can feel it. Can't you feel it? Who can feel it just with a nod of the head? Like today, today's Ashura is a little different because it falls on Jum'ah. Ah. So that's also another thing, you know, that we we don't base our Sharia on feelings, but we also recognize as human beings, yes, we can have that, you know, we can have that recognition. Any other questions? Yes. What's that? The Jews? I don't know. Um, I did a little cursory kind of search to because, I, as I, I believe, is it Yom Kippur that is the day of of Exodus, right? And so um, I don't know if they fast. Does anybody know if the if the Jewish people have a tradition of fasting? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, they fast on a Sunday. Okay. Do they have? Maybe that's homework. We can all do crowdsource it. Um, I don't know. I just did some uh, search online. Yom Kippur, which is Yom Kabir, big day, um, happens. I think their calendar is different, so it's it's uh, it's in September this year. So I don't know. That would be interesting. I, I actually personally don't know. So if anybody digs into that, the history of how did the Jewish people in Medina fast on that day is Ashura, and it coincided with the Arab calendar of Ashura, and how does that reflect today? I don't know. Has anybody looked into it at a deep level? Great question, though. Maybe one or two more questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, great question. Uh, I had mentioned about the great great grandchildren. Are there any books or resources? There are in Arabic. Um, there are some that have been translated to, into English. It is one section of, of, of literature that needs to have more uh, written about it. There are some translation of Sheikh Saleh al-Ja'fari's books. So if you type in uh, Saleh al-Ja'fari, there are more poems about the family uh, to know their names. There is a website that has even charts that you can print out with like the families and the lineage and where they are. Uh, one place where they do have a lot of recognition, actually two countries where they have a lot of recognition, I would say maybe even three, Egypt, any Egyptians in here? You can go to, there's, there's a mazar, you can go some of the, the, one of the aunts of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyida Nafisa is there. And so there's, there's some, some information, but it's mostly in Arabic. Morocco also has a, has a big tradition of recognizing that. Um, and to a, a certain extent in Iraq, and I'm speaking specifically about the Sunnis of Iraq, because 
I'm speaking completely from a Sunni tradition in terms of our recognition and respect of Ahlul Bayt. Um, there's nothing that I, does anybody know if there's anything in English? No, okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not aware, unfortunately. So, what what you can do though is you can you can you can find it from different websites. So you can like just uh, research it, and you'd have to create your own. Maybe one final question. All right, Barakallahu Fikum, may Allah bless you, and I'm uh, honored to to be able to, to to speak here. And please forgive me if I've uh, misspoken on anything. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik.